here when you sit down. <laughs> I know. It's not, no, that's not right. Yeah. This is they nice. Really I read all this stuff. This is, this is my Thursday packet. Yes, this is your packet. I read it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, all right. I don't know. Um, Count four. Let's get out of here as quick as possible. Okay. At least who's been sick for four days? What is this for now? Planning Commission. Good evening. <laughs> Please allow me to call to order the Ferndale City Council meeting of Monday, October the 11th, 2010. If you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk. Roll call, Your Honor. Council Members Baker. Here. Galloway. Here. Lennon. Here. Piana. Here. And Mayor Covey. Here as well. Thank you. All accounted for tonight. Next item, Madam Clerk. Approval of the agenda, Your Honor. Are there any changes or requests with regards to the agenda or a motion to approve? So moved. Support. Motion made and seconded. Uh, Lennon and Baker to approve as is the agenda, Madam Clerk. Council Members Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Fiana? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes as well. It passes unanimously. Next item, Madam Clerk. Presentation by Ferndale Public Schools. Good evening. My name is Jessica Stilger, Communication Specialist for the Ferndale Public Schools. And I'm here to share some news about events and some exciting news for the district. First of all, we'd like to invite the entire community to the All-District Fall Festival this coming Saturday at John F. Kennedy Elementary School. It starts at 11 a.m., ends at 3 p.m. There's going to be games, food, fun, all kinds of things inside and out of the building. Everyone's invited to come out and enjoy that event. Uh, this past Friday, our Ferndale Eagle football team uh, played a fantastic homecoming game, defeating Birmingham Groves. Probably had about 1,500 people in attendance. It was a wonderful event, great weather, very exciting homecoming. Our marching band is also doing very well. Um, they placed first at, I believe, all of their competitions so far. They are gearing up for the November 6th state competition and hopefully can continue on their winning streak. They're the five-time five -time state champions. Um, on October 28th, the district is hosting a community breakfast for senior citizens. So we invite um, anyone who is interested to come to this breakfast. It's Thursday, October 28th at 10 a.m. at Ferndale High School. We're going to have presentations from high school uh, students from Ferndale High School and University High School. And it'll be an opportunity for any senior citizens in the area who are curious about our district to learn what we have to offer to interact with our students and to ask questions of any administrators or principals. Um, if you're interested in coming, please call the Community Relations Office at 248-586-8651. We'd also like to remind everybody that the district sends out a weekly e-newsletter, something like this. Um, they are available on our website at ferndaleschools.org, but you can also sign up to receive the weekly newsletters in your email by emailing fpsfanout at ferndaleschools.org, or you can join us on Facebook. Super, thank you. Madam Clerk, what's next? We have a resolution of appreciation for Traffic Control Officer Laurel. Yes, we do. Um, Councilwoman Baker, would you uh, mind reading the resolution for us tonight? I'd be happy to. Sounds like my mic is actually on tonight. This is good. We would request unanimous support for the following resolution. Traffic Control Officer Stephen LaRoe, after serving the City of Ferndale and its citizens for 33 years, retired on June 30, 2010. Officer LaRoe began his service with the Ferndale Police Department on November 1, 1976. He attended Central Michigan University and earned a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics and Psychology with a teaching certificate in 1971. 
Officer Moreau worked as a substitute teacher for the Detroit and Ferndale Public Schools and also for Bronner Glove Company of Ferndale prior to his employment with the Ferndale Police Department. Officer Leroux graduated from the Oakland Police Academy on December 17, 1976, and was assigned to the Uniform Patrol Division. He continued with training in traffic control, alcohol enforcement, and accident investigation and reconstruction. Officer Leroux was selected to be among the first team of field training officers when the department initiated that program. He was promoted to traffic control officer on July 1, 1996. Officer Leroux's duties as traffic control officer included investigation of serious injury and fatal accidents, auxiliary police supervision and training, crossing guard supervision and training, very important, supervision of the auto impound yard, records management for breath analysis instrumentation, review and approval of accident reports, court liaison officer, traffic engineering studies, and various other duties. As he concludes his distinguished career with the City of Ferndale Police Department, Officer Leroux looks forward to spending time with his wife, Linda, his children, Todd, Kimberly, and Stephanie, stepchildren, David, Christine, and Matthew, and his first grandchild due to arrive in March 2011. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, Ferndale elected officials, do hereby express our community's deep appreciation and best wishes for a happy and healthy retirement to Traffic Control Officer Stephen Leroux as he retires after 33 years of dedicated service. Do we have unanimous support? Support. 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 Nice to recognize someone while they're still here to hear it. <laughs> very, very nice. Nice job. And there's a retirement uh, dinner coming up mm -hmm. very soon. Does anybody have that date handy? Chief? Very good. Folks are interested in attending. Uh, they can get tickets through the police department. It's in Royal Oak at the Elks. Yes. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank you again, Councilman Mayor Pro Tem. Next item, Madam Clerk. We have a presentation by the Regional Energy Office, and they have provided this handout for Council. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having us here. I uh, wanted to let you know about uh, an exciting opportunity coming to Ferndale uh, in the months up ahead. Uh, my name is Jacob Corviday. And I'm Amanda Dentler. And we're with the Regional Energy Office. The Regional Energy Office is a uh, program that was started by the Michigan Suburbs Alliance Warm Training Center in the Michigan Municipal League a few years ago to help bring energy services to local governments. And we partnered with the state of Michigan, Michigan Saves Incorporated, and several other major partners to bring in uh, a grant from the U.S. Department of Energy. And we brought $30 million into the state of Michigan that's starting this year to go into neighborhoods and do what they call a sweep of an entire neighborhood and make every home in that neighborhood energy efficient. Uh, it's a prestigious event. Uh, the governor is actually hoping to come down and be part of some media things involved within a little while. And we had spoken with Mr. Bruner and Councilwoman Piana earlier. And uh, while in the future we expect communities around Southeast Michigan to have to apply to become part of this program since we're bringing millions of dollars into each community to uh, help make these improvements, uh, Ferndale has actually been selected as the the pilot community for the entire statewide program. And that's what we want to give you a little bit of information about. Um, so that's the, that's the basic sort of overall program, and I'm going to have Amanda tell you a little bit more specifically about what's going on here. Thank you. First of all, I would like to start off by thanking Councilwoman Melanie Piana for her support and aid in bringing this program to Ferndale. Um, thank you very much. And um, I'll be the outreach director for this first Ferndale sweep, which the neighborhood that is designated is from Nine Mile to, Le to Leroy and from Allen to Pearson. So if you're a resident in that block, you can look for myself along with our outreach specialist, Sheila Vanfield, who is here tonight. Um, and we have uh, two other members, Phil, Had Phil Hadley and Sam Offen. Um, we're all outreach um, team for Regional Energy Office. Um, we're going to have our partner meeting next Thursday, and then we can expect the community kickoff on the 28th of October at the Kulik Center. So everyone will be welcomed to come and hear the information about how they can be involved in the program. In summation, basically, uh, while there's a small select portion of Ferndale that will be the sort of uh, direct target or focus of the initial program, uh, probably what we'll be doing through this is making, offering information and financial incentives and this sort of thing to any 
resident of Ferndale and making that information easily available. The whole point of the program is to make energy efficiency easy and affordable. Uh, and so we're really excited to, to be uh, working with Ferndale to sort of launch this. That's all. Super. Well, we're glad you're here. You're doing great work. We appreciate what you're doing, and we appreciate you coming to Ferndale. Thanks so much. Good luck. Congratulations. Madam Clerk, what's next? Call to audience, Your Honor. All right, we are at the call to audience. This will be a half hour portion of the meeting. It is about 20 till, so we'll go at least until 10 after the hour. Folks can talk tonight about any issue they want other than what's on the agenda. So the agenda includes a number of things tonight. So if that issue is on there, then hold off. But you may talk about any other issue. The rules are share your name and address, um, keep it to three minutes or less, and uh, we ask no personal attacks, uh, try to be as uh, courteous as possible. And we are now opening the floor to folks. Good evening. Sherry Wells, 315 West Troy. And I'm announcing the first meeting of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. It will be this coming Sunday on October 17th from 2 o'clock until 4 at St. Luke's Episcopal Church, which is at 540 West Lewiston uh, on Livernois. This is going to be for fun, friendship, community, health and safety, bulk purchasing, and more. Two meetings ago, Chris Hughes of the DDA had announced a volunteer list uh, with many opportunities for people to volunteer, and we have picked up the list as well as the forms for that, and we'll have that available at that association meeting. And I just gave these people a copy of our flyer, too, since part of that area that they mentioned is within the Downtown Neighborhood Association. And you live in that area, Mr. Covey, so we look forward to seeing you. Thank okay. you. Hi, um, Kim Beebe, B-E-E-B-E, -E -E -B -E, 511 East Drayton. Um, I would like to state that I was a member of the zoning board from 2000 to 2007, and I'm a member of the Ferndale Community Foundation. However, tonight I'm here as president of Oakland County Now, National Organization for Women. Um, Oakland County Now is having a candidates night, our endorsed candidates on Wednesday, October 20th from 7 to 9 at Affirmations in Ferndale. Um, it is, everybody is welcome, it's free, and refreshments will be served. Um, the, the, um, it will, the way it's going to be run is that each candidate will speak for about three minutes, and then after all the candidates speak, um, there will be time to meet with the candidates one-on-one -on -one if you want to and ask them individual questions. We have invited state senators, state representatives, county commissioners. Our mayor will be there. Um, we have also invited the um, Supreme Court justices and um, the Bernero office, Layton, and Jocelyn Benson. And for those of you who do not know, um, the National Organization for Women um, focuses on women's equality, reproductive rights, family planning, um, fam family court issues, and also LGBT rights. So Wednesday, October 20th from 7 to 9 at Affirmations. We would love to see all of you there, audience, audience members, and everyone that's watching this, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beebe. My name is Timothy Risk, 541 West Hazelhurst Street. Um, you're going to be inundated with a lot of energy environmental messages tonight. This is the Environmental Sustainability Commission's green tip for this month. In the interest of saving energy, the green tip is, to, is a reminder to residents to start preparing their homes now for winter. Um, please have your furnace inspected, clean your ducts, stock up on furnace filters, change them monthly. Consider, if you haven't already, switching out your thermostat for a programmable thermostat. Uh, perhaps insulate your water heater. And most importantly, check uh, for drafts uh, so that you can seal cracks, uh, put weather stripping around your doors and windows, um, caulk cracks in the house. 
Um, also, uh, this is also a reminder not to forget that many of the federal Energy Star tax credits are going to expire at the end of this December. Uh, the ones that expire this year are for qualified Energy Star biomass stoves, uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment, insulation, roofs, water heaters, windows, and doors. Uh, there are also tax credits, federal tax credits, that will not be expiring until 2016. Those are for geothermal heat pumps, small wind turbines, and uh, solar energy systems. There are also state incentives for energy efficient appliances as well as rebates from DTE for Energy Star qualified washers and dryers, programmable thermostats, and in some cases insulation and windows. And lastly, make sure to attend tomorrow's Green Tuesday presentation at 6.30 at the Kulik Center for more details about ways to save energy. Thank you, Mr. Risk, and thanks again for all the work that the uh, Environmental Sustainability Commission does. Hello, Mayor Covey, Council, Douglas Christie, Ferndale resident. Uh, kind of picking up where Tim left off there. Um, in regards to our Green Tuesday tomorrow at the Colic Center at 6.30, uh, the guest speaker who is going to be uh, talking about weatherizing your home for uh, saving money and energy uh, focusing on uh, environmental friendly improvements uh, is going to be Jacob from the Warm Train Center who spoke earlier. So uh, you will have a great expert there and again it's open to the public 6.30 to 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. I would also like to uh, mention that the um, uh, clean diesel uh, grant funding programs uh, initiatives are coming uh, up soon from the uh, EPA and the uh, state. And I believe that we have um, kind of gotten the uh, count going, or the DPW did on our uh, diesel situation here. And the FESC recommended to the city about cleaning up the uh, diesel vehicles, among other diesel uh, items here in this uh, city, in Ferndale. And there is an event uh, coming up this Wednesday, uh, the Clean Fleet Technology Forum, which is going to be down at the U of M Dearborn Fairlane Center. And we had requested trying to get somebody from the city, perhaps a DPW or someone from council or one of the other experts to sit in on this forum uh, to learn about the uh, funding and the grants that are coming available. And I just wanted to bring that to the attention of uh, the city again. Um, I, at this point in time, I don't believe we have a representative from the city going down. I know we have two members from the FESC will be there. I just wanted to see if we uh, could get that on the table and perhaps have a further discussion uh, about that uh, perhaps tomorrow. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christie. Hi, Jeannie Davis with announcements, like always. First off is this week at the community center, it's the annual spaghetti dinner again. I know you always like coming to that, Mayor. It's, it's from 5 to 7. It's on the, um, I didn't write down when it is. It's Wednesday night. Thursday, Thursday night, I knew that. <laughs> Thursday night from 5 to 7 at the Kulik Community Center. The fee is at $6 for adults, seniors get in for 5 and kids between 4 and 12, it's $3. We always have all the fixings and the desserts, and everybody visits and has an absolutely great time. So I hope everybody comes to that. Um, also, on, again on a Wednesday, but it's October 27th, the seniors are happy to once again host the mayor's town hall meeting. And this starts at 11 o'clock at the regular senior meeting. And I'd like to invite everybody to come. It's free. You don't have to pass any restrictions with age or anything. Just come ahead, enjoy. You can ask the mayor any questions you like. And there'll be a lunch available afterwards for a nominal fee. And also, on Wednesday the 27th, we seniors have put together a cookbook. And these are all of our recipes, and they're very clear. They're all tried and true recipes. But just to prove it, we're hosting at the Ferndale Library on Wednesday, October 27th, a launch party. 
And you can come to this uh, event for $10. You can sample a generous helping from most of the recipes that are in here. That's 5 to 7. Adults are $10. Children 10 and under are admitted free. So, um, and if you uh, do come and you want to buy the cookbook, you get 30% off the cookbook. So please come. It's the first launch party we've ever done in the first cookbook. And so we're excited. on the uh, October 27th? That's on the 27th. That's a Wednesday. That's right after your mayor's town hall meeting at 11 o'clock. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> how convenient. Right. Except the launch party is at the library. Okay. Well, then we'll just schlep over there. Yes. Right. I think you can find it. Yes, Thank you. And happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. Let's give Jeannie a round of applause for her uh, <laughs> good work. Hi, I'm Sharon LaPointe, 1845 Pilgrim Street. I've been having a plumbing problem since February. It's cost me $1,700 to have my inside done. And supposedly it's the county's, well, the plumber said it was the county. The county said it was the city. The city said it's the county. So, it, yeah. Now I've been going back and forth with them major. And now it's backing up into the yard. So you know what it's going to smell like. So at least I got the inside fixed, but the outside is still ridiculous. Now they say my property goes out to the middle of the road. Well, if it's property's out to the middle of my road, I can put a toll booth up, right? <laughs> Are you asking us for advice? Yes. The, the, the gentleman who can... And I went to the... over there on Camborne, and you can't even talk to him. He's very rude. Well, uh, Byron Fotides is in charge of the Department of Public Works. Um, there are policies that deal with uh, the water mains and the sewer lines from the house to the point that they reach the main, city main, and he, he would be the one you'd need to talk with. So if it's out in the road, it's my responsibility? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer, but he does, and he's sitting right in the back against the wall. He wouldn't talk whatsoever. Uh, well, I suspect his, he'll talk to you. I'm his boss, so if he doesn't talk to you, I will. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said your name was what? Sharon? Sharon LaPointe. LaPointe, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Hi. I'm Renee Hilla, and I live at 1970 Bonner. And I've been here for over 32 years now. And every year, we have astronomical increase in our water bill. Uh, some years it's been as high as 17 percent. This year it went up 10 percent. And um, they installed these new meters, and mine ticked from the time that it was installed. And they weren't able to read my meter. In the last bill that I got, they um, it was it was an untrue reading. So even though the bill stated $210 by the reading on our meter that we read ourselves, um, we ended up paying $265.60 last water bill. Now, in order to keep from getting an, aspirin, an even larger bill this time, so now this time, since the new meter has been installed, which I believe is not reading correctly, they are saying that we've used more water than we have ever used since we've lived there. Forty units of water for three people, which is just not true. And it was an estimated reading, again, because our new meter was not able to be read. So they estimated it at $259, and then our meter, again, was way higher than what the bill had said. So we called them, and they said, oh, well, you're right. You should be paying $400 for three months of water for three people. And they sent somebody out to check the meter, which had been ticking all this time, like a time bomb. And then they took the meter out. They took it to be checked out. Um, but there, there is no way that we had used 40 units of water in all of the, I have all the previous bills from the previous years for the same time of year, and the most we ever used was between 28 and 30 units. Now, we should also not be charged uh, meter, what is it, meter charge and meter operations charge when they haven't even been able to read our meter. They said our meter was not readable since May, but yet they're charging us 
all these fees besides this astronomical water rate, which we pay more water rate than anybody, I think, in the state of Michigan. And I'd like to know why you allow for our water to be raised at such astronomical rates every single year. You're killing us. You are just killing us with the water. And me and several people that I have talked to that have $400 water bills, one has $465 water bill, one has a $475 water bill, how in the world do you expect us to stay in Ferndale and pay those kind of water rates? It's like a mortgage payment. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I appreciate your comments. And you raised a number of questions, um, which we're not able to answer all here tonight. The gentleman who is speaking now with the woman who had the plumbing issue would be the gentleman to talk with specifically. Um, we pass along the water rate increases that we get from the city of Detroit. And these complaints are across the entire region, every city. Hazel Park just raised their water rates as well. And are now, is now billing on a monthly basis. They raised their rates, I believe, 17%. So we have to pass along the water rate increases from the city. Um, this time of the year is always when most people's water bills is the highest because it's the end of summer. Uh, and then the most common uh, reason for high water bills is when people check, they find sometimes that there could be leaks. They um, checked when they came to my house. When they replaced the meter with the new meter, there were no leaks. And e even at this time of year, I've got my previous bills from last year, the year before, and the year before for I the same you. time of year. And it's over 10 units less than what I'm being charged this time. I, I believe you. Um, the, there is no answer other than you could, you know, you say have to move to another city, but your water bills would be just as high in any not other Warren. city that My you go to. My son lives in Warren. They do not pay this kind of, so they don't, they don't pay this So if the Warren. meter is ticking all the time, that means there's a leak. Um, if you turn everything off in the house and the water meter is still going, No, it only ticks when the water's running. running. It didn't tick when the water wasn't running. Only oh, okay. when the, so it was a faulty meter, but you'd think that they're going to tell me that and adjust my water bill accordingly? That the meter was faulty when it ticked the whole time we had it and they couldn't read it? Well, again, uh, we're not able tonight to, uh, to solve the problem, but if you want to talk with the uh, Byron for tidies and the city manager, we'll also see that, uh, that we do the best we can to try to get answers for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. Um, my name is Jill Stricker, and I'm with the Ferndale Recreation Department. I have two announcements this evening. Um, first off, our youth soccer program came to a close this past Saturday at Mountain Road Park. So I'd like to thank all of our volunteer coaches for a great season and a job well done. Um, secondly, I would like to remind everyone of the upcoming Hilton Fall Festival put on by the Ferndale Recreation Department and the Ferndale Area Chamber of Commerce. The event is Saturday, October 23rd from 2 to 8 p.m. on Hilton Road between Camborne and Brickley Street. Activities include kids' carnival games, pony rides, hay rides, face painting, bounce house, rock climbing wall, costume contest, and much more. And I would also like to thank the following sponsors. CNN Party Rental, Gage Products, Grand Central Self Storage, Leonard Brothers, Premium Electric, Lenny's Copy Center, Smart Transportation, The Ferndale Rotary, Ferndale Schools, Seabiz Solutions, Dino's Lounge, M1 Studios, Pete's Place, Hilton Road Cafe, s and Agency, Connective Casting, Oakland County Parks, Cladog Chiropractic, BNS Electric, and Lighting Supply. Wow. Thank you. Excellent corporate support from our local businesses for the uh, Ferndale Fall Festival. Mm -hmm. Celebrating a little Halloween as well? Yes. Very good. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. It's October 23rd in the afternoon for all the kids and the adults who are still kids. What else? Mr. Petrie. Hello, Council. Joel Petrie, 2530 Bonner, also the co-chair of the uh, Financial Budget Commission. Just came in to report that uh, the commission and the committee is, uh, are moving along I believe at a pace where we were set before to go at. So we're on pace right now. I see Greg here also. Um, also to answer any questions that may have arisen from a, an email, uh, our secretary, the city manager, also addressed it per the email um, that went out to confirm one of our subcommittee meetings and it was misinterpreted by uh, a resident and hopefully that uh, that answer was taken care of. Sure. So if there are any further questions, I can address those. I know you're working hard. 
Yeah, there's been no decisions. You're still gathering information. Correct. Committees, you have subcommittees working in different avenues. Right. We uh, appreciate all the hard work. We know you're meeting every Wednesday for hours. Yes, this Wednesday we had a subcommittee meeting last week. This one we're going to go with a regular meeting, 6.30 till 8 o'clock at the Kulik Center. Uh, the following week we will be meeting earlier, and it is an open meeting. We have a number of speakers scheduled to arrive. Uh, everything will be posted for the city manager. These are public meetings open Correct. to all. Yes. All right. We appreciate the hard work that you and Mayor Porter and all of the other committee members are doing. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Petrie. All right, seeing no other folks for the call to uh, audience, we will move on, Madam Clerk. Consent agenda, Your Honor. Item A, approval of the minutes of the meeting of September 27th. B, approval to modify the road closure of Hilton between Camborne and Mapledale on Saturday, October 23rd from 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. for the Hilton Fall Festival event. Item C, approval of municipal and community credit contract for fiscal year 2011 and authorization for the mayor to de or designate to sign the contract. Item D, approval of the boiler and potable water annual service agreement between the city and Kimco Products, Inc. in the amount of $3,025 from account as listed. Item E, approval of the Rec Pro Registration Software Annual Service Agreement between the City and RC Systems in the amount of $3,400. Item F, approval of the one-year agreement to use the City's Southwest Storage Yard as a transfer site for leaves by the City of Pleasant Ridge and authorization for the Mayor and City Clerk to sign the agreement. Item G, approval to refigure the Sidewalk Cardship Committee to include the following. Public work directors for tidies and any future public works director by virtue of his or her office. Mayor Covey, previously appointed on January 11th, 2010 for a term expiring 1231-11. Greg Polica, previously appointed on 10-13-2008 to represent Southeast Ferndale for a term expiring December 31st, 2011. Joe Mahan, previously appointed on June 14th, 2005, to represent Northwest Ferndale for a term expiring December 31st, 2011. Ann Heller, previously appointed on June 24th, 2005, to represent Southwest Ferndale for a term expiring December 31st, 2011. And Joel Petrie, previous appointment unknown, to represent Northeast Ferndale for a term expiring December 31st, 2011. And finally, item H, approval of the bills and payrolls as certified by the city manager to be paid subject to review by the Council Finance Committee. Well done. That's the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to pull anything for further discussion? Your Honor, I would move that we adopt the <coughs> consent agenda in its entirety. Support. Thank you. Well done. Uh, Galloway makes the motion, uh, seconded by Councilwoman Piana, to adopt as is the uh, entire consent agenda. Discussion, Madam Clerk. Council Members Galloway. Yes. Piana. Yes. Baker. Yes. And Mayor Covey. Yes, that passes unanimously. Uh, that takes care of the consent agenda. Then we are on the regular agenda, uh, Madam Clerk. What would the first item be? Consideration of amendments to the zoning ordinance regarding medical marijuana facilities. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn the meeting over briefly to uh, City Manager uh, Bruner. Would you be introducing this item for us? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I will. Um, back in August on the 19th at its regular meeting, the Plan Commission held a public hearing regarding proposed zoning ordinance amendments that would permit medical marijuana facilities in uh, various zoning districts throughout the city. Uh, it made a recommendation and forwarded it to Council, which considered the issue at its regular meeting of August 23rd. At that time, the Council passed ordinance number 1098 as amended uh, which permits medical marijuana facilities as special land uses <coughs> in the OS office service district M1 light industrial district and M2 general industrial districts uh, the city council removed the plan commission uh, recommendation to also allow them as special land uses in the C2 general commercial and di uh, districts and C3 extended business districts and referred uh, that issue back to the Plan Commission for further discussion and consideration. Uh, in addition, also consideration of a potential zoning overlay district. Uh, the Plan Commission uh, reconsidered that at its regular meeting on September 16th. Um, it reaffirmed its uh, previous recommendation on the subject, which was C2 and C3. 
Uh, it did not take any action regarding an overlay district. Um, so basically what this, this comes down to, and there's been a little bit back and forth between the council and the plan commission, whether medical marijuana facilities belong in C2, C3, and or um, MDX2, which is our uh, mixed use zoning district. Um, since this time, uh, obviously there's been some recent developments in terms of medical marijuana facilities here in Oakland County. Um, obviously the raids of uh, clinical relief and the other establishment in, in Waterford took place shortly after the council took this action to uh, permit the zoning in the, uh, in the M1, M2, and OS commercial districts. In, in one subsequent news article on the subject, I, I thought it was interesting that the uh, founder of the National Organization to Reform Medical or to Reform Marijuana Laws was quoted as saying, running a dispensary in Michigan under current law is very risky, and I would advise against it. Um, obviously, a lot of people are waiting to see what happens as these, case, these uh, cases work through the court system. So my recommendation at this point is to delay consideration of any additional amendments to, to the zoning ordinance and see how things play out in the M1, M2, and OS districts here in Ferndale, um, as well as uh, the, the, the state law, how potential changes uh, may come through at the state level or we receive um, guidance from the courts. Well, thank you, Mr. Bruner. We'll start off with uh, requests for information from council members. And, and if I could just re remind us then, we obviously at a previous meeting have uh, selected some areas where these kind of facilities are proper uh, based on our interpretation. And the Planning Commission has come back with its expert recommendation that we go ahead and include C2 and C3. That's correct. All right. And, uh, and your reasoning, or at least your suggestion that maybe we hold off is because of the confusion and, and the uh, issues going on with the Sheriff's Department and such? Well, yeah, and, and specifically, the reason that there's been this kind of conversation back and forth over commercial, the, the C2, C3, and the MXD, uh, the concerns that I heard council members express previously were its proximity to residential neighborhoods. And now we're not just talking about the proximity of these facilities to residential neighborhoods, but also the proximity of potential future raids to residential neighborhoods. And I, I think it, it may be in the best interest of the city to not invite that kind of additional uh, drama into the city at this point until we figure out how that's going to play out in the courts at, at the state level. Well, I appreciate your, appreciate your comments. Is the Planning Commission recommendation to also include a mixed two district or no? No, initially it considered right. whether the mixed use or the commercial districts were the appropriate place. Uh, it, it concluded that the commercial districts uh, were where it, it felt right. were the appropriate. And I, I, obviously I'm going to let other folks ask questions. Um, but I just had one or two more. Um, Council, uh, Councilwoman Baker, you're on the Planning Commission. Are there other Planning Commission members in the audience tonight? Not that I know of. All right, I appreciate that. All right. Um, what questions would uh, Council members like to ask or get well, from me? I, I really don't have any questions other than I, I do concur with Mr. Bruner on uh, basically leaving well enough alone right now while this thing plays out through the judicial system. I think the law written as it is right now is kind of vague. I think uh, Lancy needs to do a little bit of better homework. And uh, I am all for just leaving it go right now as, as it is and uh, letting it play out. Well, I appreciate your opinion. Any other questions, though, that people would like to request information before we possibly have a motion that we could then discuss? <clears throat> yeah, I was. Uh not at the city council meeting where we discussed medical marijuana last time. Um, just so I'm clear, uh, these facilities are currently special land uses in M1, M2, and OS, and the only cited uh, facility that we have right now is in the MXD2, um, and that's the clinical relief that was shut down, right? It's a little bit, uh, there's another layer to it. Um, the MXD, or I'm sorry, the M1 and M2 
um, there are not sales permitted in those districts. That's is that am I right? No, great. They're allowed to have the grow operations market. there, but in the OS district, any type of grow operation is limited to 20 percent of the square footage, uh, the, the floor area of the facility. So currently, uh, in yeah. Ferndale, you can grow in M1 and M2, which are the sort of triangular patterns along the railroad tracks. Yes. And the dispensaries are no, along the. It's, it's, the, the ordinance doesn't use the word dispensary. It's referred to as facility, okay. and it uses the definition of the, the state statute. Something similar to what's on Hilton. So the facilities uh, for medical marijuana would be on Nine Mile uh, east of Faro and Eight Mile east of Faro. And those larger office and like industrial spaces. Or M1 or M2 as well. Or M, but okay, Did but the facilities that? would not be allowed in M1. Or, Sales would not be allowed in M1 or M2. They, they are allowed in, in M1 and M2 as well. Okay. But, okay, so everything that's allowed in OS would be allowed in M1 or M2. Yes. Right. But the amount of the grow operation in OS limited. would be limited to 20%, whereas there would be no limitation on the size of the grow operation as a percentage of the total facility in M1 or M2. Yes. Right. And we currently, uh, MXD2 is not... Uh, it's not, it's not uh, included in the ordinance that council already adopted. Okay. And everything is a special land use, not a, a permitted use. Right. Correct. And um, just, you know, I've read the minutes here, but wondered if Councilwoman Baker might be able to elaborate on um, why uh, OS2 and uh, M1 and M2 were felt uh, to be the appropriate to be appropriate, and why C2 and C3, you know, what was the reasoning behind each of the districts? If I'll start with the, with the M1, M2 um, conversation. That was, uh, again, when it comes to the uh, appropriateness of a facility for, a, you know, a, a large um, power supply um, or any type of, um, uh, you know, large open space layout. Um, those are the buildings that are a furthest from residential um, and already set up to accommodate um, manufacturing type processes. Um, when it comes to the OS, those are the buildings that are um, often slightly smaller than an M1 or M2, but do have street frontage. And uh, in almost all of them, I think they have their own parking lots. Um, so there wouldn't be necessarily on street parking or people parking in residential areas. The conversation um, that the Planning Commission had between MXD2 and the, the C districts, the commercial districts, um, had to do with, again, relative proximity to the neighborhoods. They're both very close to neighborhoods. It was a, almost a negligible difference, but when it came to the C2 and the C3, more of those properties had dedicated parking lots, um, uh, which gave them a bit of a buffer um, from neighborhoods while still giving a retail frontage. The Planning Commission was trying to be as fair as possible um, in allowing what was at that time um, sort of loosely interpreted, you know, to be a legitimate business use that's now being questioned, obviously, um, into some type of retail district. Um, the Planning Commission was very careful not to um, impose so many restrictions that it would essentially zone a use out of existence. And um, was there any finding of facts at the plan Commission level that the OS designation was currently insufficient for operations that want a site in the city of Ferndale? Not necessarily. I don't know that there have been. I looked through the last CDS report, and I didn't see that there had been any um, CFOs issued um, for new facilities in the city. So I, I would imagine there are probably some things in process, but. Well, now that the, uh, the public hearing has been held, is that sufficient for all time? I mean, could we revisit this in a year? And adopt their recommendations um, regarding C2 and C3? and C3? Or would we have to have another public hearing? So if we if we decided to do nothing tonight, just leave the zoning designation as it is, um, but decided at a later date that we in fact wanted to consider C2 and C3 again, would we have to go through the public hearing process again? Uh, I think that uh, to the extent that uh, the time frame becomes too long, it would be my recommendation to conduct an additional uh, public hearing at the uh, Plan Commission level, uh, exactly where that time frame is, you know, I, I don't think I can say. But but if it becomes stale, then I think it would be prudent to have another public hearing. If 
if we revisited this before the next general election, so before fall of 2011, I would still I would still suggest uh, if there is that type of delay that another public hearing be held by the plan commission to provide any additional uh, guidance that it has on the issue. So it's a it's a continuum, but so November of this year would probably be okay to adopt the recommendations. January of next year might be a little bit shakier ground, and November of next year would be your re strong recommendation. To yes. Um, since the councilman was asking about the public hearing, could you remind us, Councilwoman uh, Baker, mm -hmm. when the public hearing was held? I believe that the date August 19th. I August 19th. Was there a lot of, uh, were, there, were there negative comments, or what was the nature, do you recall, of the? The only negative comment that I recall um, was at the following council meeting, and that's the only negative comment that I recall uh, overall, and it was from one resident um, who expressed some specific concern about businesses along 8 Mile Boulevard. Okay. And that was, I think, the reason that we sent it back to the Planning Commission for further Very clarification. Good. All right. Other requests for information? Anyone in the audience wish to ask any questions, and then we'll see if we want to move towards uh, any type of motion. All right, because um, I have some thoughts on this as well, but uh, is there anyone interested in uh, doing a motion? I guess, I guess not. I'm interested in keeping the status quo. So I, I, I'm conflicted. Um, one is that the Planning Commission has put their best recommendation forward based off of what they know of the law, too. However, um, at the Michigan Municipal League conference um, a couple of weeks ago, the medical marijuana session, although I was not on it at it, um, was the largest attended single session at the conference. Um, and I think that is indicative of what type of struggle every community is having in terms of navigating the, the, the legal parameters of, at the state law. And it is complicated. And I think Ferndale has been um, pretty forward thinking with its own ordinance and diving in and paying for legal services to figure out what our current ordinance should be. Um, so with that said, um, and being very contemplative about it, I. I I'm willing to sit back a little bit and see how this works out. So um, not only to give better comfort to our um, police chief, um, but also to the planning department, because I think this is where our professional staff um, are the facilitators of um, implementing and interpreting um, what is coming from them, from the, from the applicants. And so um, even though our ordinance has made it more clear, um, there are still complexities, and we still need to go through our legal review on applications. Mm -hmm. So is that correct? Probably. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it can't be. These applications are still going to be needed to be administratively approved um, with legal support. So that, those were my thoughts are generally. So um, if the state actually makes some decisions in the next six months, that would be great. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, and uh, this, again, is just so disappointing because the history of, of Lansing is one to not take any action. They've failed us on this issue for two years, and they will probably fail us again in the next year. Um, I appreciate the city manager's comments that, uh, you know, we, we certainly don't want to put neighbors at risk in terms of uh, there being any sort of raids. Um, and yet that's just <clears throat> so disappointing that, that to, to some extent uh, the city of Ferndale is being held hostage in the sense that uh, we're trying to follow what the people have voted for three times in this city, and that is that they would like to have medical marijuana available for people with special health issues. In the meantime, it will wind its way through the courts. Um, it'll cost the taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars. The lawyers will get rich. And in the meantime, um, we've had a chilling effect now. Cities across the state uh, are afraid to do anything because they don't want to have, uh, I guess, you know, 
raids in their in their city. So, um, your, your Honor, would you like me to provide the uh, at this point uh, any type of input? Uh, yes, from you my did, meeting, you did meet with the county prosecutor. Yeah, as in, I uh, indicated at the last meeting, uh, there was a uh, a countywide conference. Uh, it wasn't really a conference, but it was a meeting uh, hosted by the, the county prosecutor with the majority of the uh, municipal attorneys in the county. Uh, at which uh, some of the shortcomings of the state initiative were discussed uh, and uh, a, a, a broad discussion of, of how different municipalities are uh, trying to address this issue. And, and as Council already is aware, the, the three principal uh, methodologies that communities are using right now are either uh, to ban it uh, based on uh, the possession of marijuana still being a Schedule One drug, which would be uh, uh, against federal law uh, or uh, do nothing from the standpoint of any uh, zoning or regulatory action at the uh, local level uh, or attempt to uh, provide uh, a uh, appropriate regulation based on the, the particular uh, community's assessment of, of needs regarding regulation. So those are the three options. Council's already aware of them. Those were, were raised a long time ago as, as the different uh, options that it had. Uh, there was at this meeting a, a suggestion that uh, the legislature should be educated with respect to the shortcomings of the state initiative, recognizing the, the difficulty of, of having any type of uh, citizen initiative uh, modified it would require a three quarters, a 75 percent majority of, uh, of legislation, uh, legislature to uh, provide any type of amendment to the state law. So uh, there, there really was not a consensus. Uh, the uh, feedback from the other communities is that there is a, uh, a great discrepancy in how communities are trying to address this uh, in trying to navigate this uh, uh, statute, which uh, is not a model of clarity. Certainly. Well, I appreciate that. And, and the city of Ferndale and its, this council has demonstrated and said many times that it wishes to follow the, the wishes of the voters. So I, I do not uh, criticize anyone at this table. But um, remembering going back, if uh, the state legislature had done its job, we wouldn't have had to have a citizen initiative, um, which then results in all the confusion and all of the chaos and all of the drama. So at this point, then, the message is that Ferndale has already set aside some zoning areas where these facilities can be. Um, we hope to be able to have them open and functioning for people with uh, medical issues who have recommendations from their doctors. We hope to not have uh, raids and SWAT teams coming in um, and arresting patients and, and looking at people's private medical records. But in the meantime, we'll hold off on adding any other uh, zoning areas. Seeing no other uh, motion than Madam Clerk, next item. We are at regular agenda item B, which is consideration of a development agreement with Robert Wolfson regarding the development of a public parking structure and residential dwelling units on the Withington parking lot. Thank you. Mr. Bruner. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, back in 2006, Richard Associates conducted a downtown parking study uh, for the DDA. Uh, it, it identified that we had a shortfall of available parking at that time on both the east side and the west side of downtown, uh, with the shortfall being greater on the west side than the east side. Uh, following that study, uh, the city and the DDA worked together to evaluate potential uh, ways to alleviate that shortfall with a parking structure on the Withington lot uh, quickly emerging as the, um, uh, the most efficient way to do so. Uh, the DDA had Rich and Associates uh, study the fe that feasibility of that um, in uh, following the 2006 study and then again the Rich and Associates revisited that those options in January of this year and estimated the cost of uh, building a 455 space parking structure at uh, $7.2 million. Now during the budget process last year we spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about parking and how to finance uh, a parking structure at some point in the not too distant future. Um, the City Council in the 
the budget year that we're currently in, uh, stop the transfer of 15% of gross auto parking revenue to the general fund um, and looked at potentially in future years uh, putting parking ticket revenue that's currently booked in the general fund back into the auto parking fund as ways to uh, fund a parking structure. But even still, there would be uh, a gap in the, in the financing of, that would have to be closed with additional revenues, either through changes in hours or rates or by bringing uh, some other financing to bear on a parking structure such as special assessments. Uh, in the meantime, Mr. Uh, Wolfson, who is the developer of the Lofts on Nine uh, building across the street here on East Nine Mile, um, has been studying this issue and he has proposed a public-private partnership uh, that would involve developing a potential publicly owned parking structure on the Withington lot with a uh, private apartment complex, apartment building on top that would generate tax revenue. And that tax revenue could be captured by the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority uh, and or the Downtown Development Authority to help pay for the parking structure. Uh, the tax revenue from that apartment building alone would not pay for it, but it, it would certainly um, bridge the gap uh, that the city's been facing using existing revenues or changes in, in rates and hours. Um, Mr. Wolfson had, uh, has been talking to the DDA about it for some time. Uh, Mr. Chris and I met uh, with him and, and his attorneys back in September. Uh, we requested some additional information about his uh, tax estimate, and that's provided in your in your packet along uh, with a letter from him dated September 17th. Um, so it became very apparent that uh, negotiating a development agreement um, would take some considerable amount of time and energy on the part of me and the city attorney. Uh, so before moving ahead with that, uh, the city attorney and I discussed it and decided we should get some direction from the council as to whether or not this is a uh, private, a public-private partnership <coughs> that is interested in pursuing, and if so, what might be some of the general terms and conditions that the city council would be interested in seeing incorporated into such an agreement. Um, so with that, I think Mr. Wilson is, is here and may have a couple uh, comments for you as well before you begin your deliberations. Sure, Mr. Wolfson. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council Members and Mayor and everybody else. Um, as everybody knows, I work here, I live here. Um, I live in our loft project. I've kind of looked around and I like the city and I've been trying to get more involved in the city. And I know that parking has been an issue. Reports have been done in the past. Those reports were from 2007 and came up with a, a pretty big need for parking. And that's before Rosie's came around and some of the other places that have opened up since. So the need is still there. The money is not there. The economic times really doesn't allow to take money from one place and pull it from another place. And, and it's probably not a very good political um, effort on anybody's part. But um, I think there's a way that uh, we've come up with our attorneys and tried to figure out how we can make it a reality. How do you get the parking that you need and what do you need to do to, to do it? And essentially, the taxes that we generate in Lofts on Nine are $173,000 a year, the equivalent of that based on square footage. There's 40,000 square feet there. There'll be 60,000 square foot in this other project. Um, and if you take those numbers, which are straight from the city records and taxes that we have, it, we can capture all of the money from Lansing to use that to pay your bond. The bond is approximately uh, $7.7 .7 million, I believe, and the cost is somewhere around $625,000. And we are looking at another avenue that may bring that down to 475, and I'll let Kurt speak to that uh, by bringing it to a 4% bond, which this, the federal government will give back 45% of the 4%. But that's just a plus. That's above and beyond 
what we're talking about. What we think we've done is identified a way with some increases in your parking rates that are not any higher than any other cities around that Ferndale kind of competes with. Um, keeping those rates at the same rate, there's some monies coming in above the $6 on the tickets. Um, and if you take those dollars and you take our $173,000 that we're contributing without any, um, any monies coming in from the parking deck, no monies, and we know that's the reason it gets built is to make money out of it, but if you don't have any of those calculations, it still makes money. And so I guess I'm here to say it can be a reality. It takes a lot of effort. We have a short fuse to be able to get our dollars approved. But uh, my goal is I think it's what people call a win-win situation or a free lunch, which genuinely doesn't really happen. But in this particular case, it really is. I mean, I've, I've been involved here for a while. We did do what we say we were going to do when other people didn't do it. And this really is, has the potential of, of happening without really doing much more than just agreeing to spend some time. We've asked that we sit down with the, the mayor and council and maybe get a, 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 the ability to sit with you guys on a, on a, a, where you get more information and get more comfortable because there's really no hidden agenda. We're asking for land and there are some questions that maybe uh, you may be thinking but aren't asking, like, you know, what are we paying for the land? Well, we're not paying anything for the land. It's air rights. If we didn't build it, there wouldn't be the $173,000 coming in. And that $173,000 is $5 million over the next 30 years. And, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. It helps us make this possible because there's really not anybody trying to develop anything in Michigan of any consequence. And I think this gives the opportunity to the, to the city to, the, to show the state, to show the nation that Ferndale can do something where other people have been looking to try to figure out how to do something to help the economy. We'll also bring in, I believe, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 people a day walking around uh, in the city, probably spending as much as two to three million dollars in the city. It helps the businesses, the retailers, the restaurants. And, um, you know, we would love to be involved in it. We are only do doing what we would do if we were looking at any other piece of property and say we'd like to build an apartment project. It just so happens that it makes sense to build it on top of a parking deck that allows you to get the money. Mr. Wilson, we appreciate this. Are there, did you want your other uh, gentleman to speak? in terms of introduction? Kurt, would you like to say something? Because we'll also have questions and okay. answers. and. And we'll see if uh, the DDA director wishes to speak as well. Thank Certainly. You. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kurt Brower, Warner Narcos and Judd, 2000 Town Center, Southfield, Michigan. Um, I think Bob summed up pretty well uh, what the overall scope of the project is going to be. Uh, just a couple of specific items that he mentioned. He referenced the Brownfield program. And really what, what will make this project work is the ability uh, to, to utilize two components of the Brownfield program. One is uh, currently there are zero dollars uh, generated in terms of taxable value on that property because it's municipally owned. Uh, the addition of the apartment units would cause there to be a you know, dramatic increase in the taxable value. You could capture that uh, with the approval at both the city level and the state level, uh, the hundred and let's call it hundred eighty thousand uh, dollars hopefully rising over time to pay off uh, part, of the, part of the debt obligation. The other part of it that, that really uh, helps the developer side out for those private units at the top is the Michigan uh, business tax credit under the Brownfield program, which is a credit currently, if we can get everything done in time, 20% um, uh, credit on uh, about $8 million of investment, so credit of a million six, which uh, goes in as equity into the deal and makes the project financeable on the private side. Um, there is some potentially uh, available some economic development bonds under the Recovery Act, uh, waiting to hear back from the county on the availability of those. So uh, here to answer any questions that you may have. Before, sure. Well, let's, uh, Christine Ducia Shepard, did you want to introduce or share anything in terms of just the introduction? Then we'll get to this. Council. I'll, I'll keep this brief too. Um, the Ferndale DDA has been working on this with Bob Wolfson at 
for probably a couple months, two months now. Um, we first started reviewing it in August uh, with him at the board meeting, and then in September um, we had additional information that we could actually go from, and the board is in full support unanimously. Um, in this project. We, we know that there is a lot more that has to be done in order to finalize this project, but we have to start to get the wheels going, and that is what we're trying to do today. Um, we have to be able to start to go into negotiations on the agreement. There are things that are um, variables that could change ultimately what the final price is, obviously, in terms of your bond debt coverage. but. Those are things that we still have to work on. We know that we're going to need to have public input on the private or on the public component um, in terms of the parking deck, and we will we are still planning to do that. But that will have to come after we can finally get this portion completed and get them the reassurance that we want to work with them, and hopefully, in the end, it comes back as a finished product. And I think that's what um, you're attempting to do with an, with an agreement and putting an agreement together. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, Councilman? You well, I've ready? got a question for uh, Ms. Shepardesius. Um, you said you've been considering this since August um, and that you had other materials. Did you have something other than the September 17, 2010 uh, email from Bob Wilson to Bob Bruner when you were uh, considering and making your recommendation? I'm not sure what email you're referring to, well, but... September 17th, 2010, and it says it's a uh, one paragraph. Pursuant to our request, I have a closed schedule uh, regarding estimated annual taxes to be generated by the residential component. Is your decision or was the DDA's recommendation based on anything other than that? No. No. So Actually, our, your, our decision in terms of what we were looking at was based on over a year's worth of process of looking at the overall parking system and the failures of the current parking system to be generating enough dollars to build a parking structure and the things that we would need to do to, in order to put that in place and knowing that even still we would have gaps with that. In working with Mr. Wolfson, you begin to identify that you have almost 4.5 to $5 million that could be generated into the parking structure through private investment. And it's taking those TIF dollars from the BRA and the DDA to reinvest back into that structure, which basically allows the city not to have to spend any general fund on the parking structure. It also reduces the amount of revenue or uh, yeah, amount of revenue that the auto parking fund would have to put towards the bond debt as well. I have more detailed information that I can definitely share with you in terms of our approach and the um, uh, the role of the DDA in terms of looking at parking management. Uh, regardless of whether or not the DDA manages the parking system, this development is a good idea. And that is why the DDA is supporting us. But just so I'm clear, your recommendation is based on, is based purely upon Bob Wilson's um, estimate of taxes generated from the parking structure. No. no. She misspoke. Okay, then I guess what I'm trying to get is, you have, in our packet we had a parking uh, study from 2007, and we've got one letter uh, from Bob Wilson dated September 17, 2010. That's the only information that we received for consideration this evening. And what you're telling me is that you received quite a bit more information. You've been from, studying other things? From Mr. Wilson himself. Yeah. I have personally met with their attorney to go over what possibilities are the variables, basically, the ED bonds, which could help to reduce the, the cost, the 45% that could go back in based on the interest um, that is charged to the, to the bond. Um, it's, it's looking at the financial structure. We're not at this point. We're not at a stage where we can look at the design of the development. No, and, and that's not what I'm getting at. but. Um, the recommendation was based on something more than what City Council has been provided, um, apparently. Well, um, all of our all of our minutes, all of our information in terms of the DDA. I also provided um, uh, the City Manager a uh, a. a a memo um, that basically articulated some of the information in terms of our work on the management plan for the parking system. Um, so if that is something that you would like to, to see, we can definitely get that to you. However, 
I think in preparation for this meeting, he has taken that information from that memo and put it into what was his memo. It's just not all the specific details of what we provided. We had a role of spreadsheet and as to, you know, how did we calculate how much money could be generated based on modifications to the parking system. So I, I don't think that was the role of tonight's meeting. It, the role of tonight's meeting is to hopefully get your feedback in terms of um, things that the city attorney needs to take into consideration with a negotiation. Let me jump in if I may because the city manager and I had a discussion today and I let him know that some of these questions would come up. So would you mind, because I think you're the right point person for these questions that the councilman's asking. What is our goal tonight, and, and well, why did we not have a whole stack of, of things to look at? Tonight, basically, the city attorney and I are asking for direction as to whether or not this is something that the council wants us to spend a lot of t additional time researching and bringing those details back to the council. I think in answer to Councilman Galloway's question, the DDA has been spending a lot of time and resources doing its own research, uh, which it has, is basing its um, recommendations on. And before uh, the city jumps into uh, that same kind of, of research with both feet, we wanted to get some direction from the council as to whether or not this was something that the council was interested in pursuing further. So this is, is at this early stage is basically kind of a, a go, no go decision, you know, go with uh, specific terms and conditions, what have you. It's an opportunity for us to hear back from council first before we um, proceed on this because as Mr. Wolfson uh, has indicated and as I indicated in the memo, there are some time restrictions in terms of economic development incentives that are going to expire at the end of the well, calendar year. So, so what are the you know one thing that I think council always despises, um, Bob, is being told that uh, they're up against some sort of wall where they have to make a decision, uh, and especially when we're not informed uh, why there's that wall. So, um, I'd like uh, before I'm ready to take any action, I need to understand why we need to make a decision tonight rather than just that something happens at the end of the year. I can help to address the timeline a little bit. Um, in terms of the timeline that we're up against, um, the, we have met with the MEDC um, on a couple of occasions regarding uh, potential development. And um, at this point, what we're looking at is that we would need to probably have a development agreement um, in place by October 25th um, in order for that, um, that the developer could go before uh, the Brownfield Redevelopment Authority for a BRA plans as well as um, the DDA to be able to put an agreement in place that would have it state that its TIF dollars would be relinquished to the BRA in order to pay for the bond debt. Um, you would also have to have a resolution in place uh, by the November 22nd meeting, if you're going to stick to your typical meeting schedules. Um, that would state that you are willing to um, do the bond for the parking structure because by December 1st is when the developer needs to have his application into the state. Um, the state um, has what is called the Michigan um, Business Tax Credit that's available. It is it extinguishes at the end of the year. You can get your application in by December 1st. Um, and actually, um, Mr. Wolfson's attorney could probably explain that a little bit further. Um, but with that, in meeting with the MEDC, we had to back that up in terms of where we where are we are at, what type of things do we have to put in place before um, we actually bring it to the state level. The MBT credits are not, um, at this point, have been um, guaranteed whether or not they're going to be extended into the 2011 year. Um, so that is why there is a need or a rush um, for going, going forward with this. 20% tax credit on the uh, private component is is huge in this day in an economy. As many people know, it is hard to find finan financing. And it's not just hard, it's almost impossible. And this is one of the avenues to help to actually finance the project. So um, speaking with the MEDC, um, MEDC is very excited about this project. 
um, and there's a lot of work that has to be done over the next couple months. Um, but we need to either decide now or or forego it and and look at it later in next year if there's even an opportunity and there might not be that opportunity anymore let's uh, let other council members ask questions well, we don't even know if this is and more than likely it is but we don't know if it's brownfield eligible right uh, we, have a phase, we have a phase one that was done and um they're getting approval for the phase two and that's really what you know this is a concept that we have looked at some pretty simple um, numbers we know how much money comes in from the parking it's an exact number that has been going on for you know every year we know what the increases are we know what it costs to build a parking deck no matter who builds it it's going to be fifteen thousand eighteen thousand dollars per parking space so there's no secret in that and we know how much money we're going to generate in our taxes to help pay for it the purpose of this is just to say if we can get together and give you all these facts, we already ha have these facts. Christina's had these facts. Everybody knows what, what came up in the parking, how much money the parking uh, uh, rates are, are bringing in, the revenues that are coming in. And everybody pretty much knows how much it costs to, to build one of these things. Whether the fee is 3% or 5% or 6% that somebody's getting, there's also benefits by um, uh, having the same building company doing both things, it'd be kind of crazy to have somebody building on top and somebody building on the bottom and paying general conditions of three or $400,000 to one general contractor and the same to the other when they could be saving money that way. But it's not a question of, I, I know our taxes, it's not a question of what does our project cost. I mean, I, I don't mind sharing it. I don't know. I haven't designed it yet. But what I do know is the taxes are going to be $173,000 at a minimum a year. It could be $210,000. And all that's doing is it's helping it reduce it. So by allowing us to, to get the right to, to meet with the city attorney and the city manager just gives us a chance to come back to you guys and say, here are ex more specifics, but we already know in general that it works and it doesn't cost the city any money and it does something that it will be helpful to this city. Let me ask if I, well, Councilman, I and just, then I'd I like to hear this, from the other council yeah, members. Yeah, one more question. I didn't see in this paperwork at all anything on maintenance costs. Oh. And uh, Christina? who's going to maintain it? Who's going to fix it? The, the material that's presented tonight doesn't include any of the operational income or mm -hmm. the maintenance of the structure I, itself. It, we have limited material here, and uh, and one let, through the city attorney, we'll always have an opt-out clause. And just basically, everything we do is something like this. Well, contract. yeah, it, to the extent that council decides uh, that it wants uh, to move forward, it's not commitment uh, until right. there's something uh, concrete that would okay. be brought back it, it's right. essentially giving direction that there's interest amongst the council members amongst council to uh, right. consider the matter further and, and try to develop an agreement that you could consider thank you uh, Dan thank you Councilwoman. Councilwoman Baker do you have any questions absolutely um, there are a lot of ifs um, but overall this is this is the type of thing um, that cities are, are trying to, to plan and make work um, in a down economy um, in order to keep moving forward. Um, but I, I wonder, um, two of those cities who were doing things like this when the economy was booming, Dearborn and Pontiac, um, were sort of left holding the bag when they got into the public-private partnership and put a bunch of money in and then a developer had some problems. And what you just mentioned about construction um, and how things would be coordinated, um, would you be comfortable you know, as you negotiate perhaps um, a contract, giving us some assurances that you, uh, we, we won't get to a point where we have a parking structure and then we run out you of money. Have, we would have a bond that would okay. guarantee you. Um, my role is really, is really to assemble it, to spend the money and the time that you would in previous times maybe pay a consultant several hundred thousand dollars to come to you and say, here's, here's what can be done. I we know it works. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we're willing to spend the time to just so that we're not spinning our wheels. That's the only thing I don't want to do is come up with ways that are creative to help 
to get bonds that will be cheaper than you normally could work on, to get uh, the, you know, the MBT credits that make it possible because it is almost – you don't see anybody building anything. Bob, and just to clarify a point, um, and, and I don't want to take away from, from um, Kate, but you're talking about a completion bond as far as any sort of completion of the project. But in order to finance it, you're talking about a city-issued bond with the full faith and credit of our taxpayers fronting the money for your development. No, no, no not for mine. No, no so just for yours. Just I, just only thing I'm doing structure. for you guys okay. is spending the time to figure out so I can build a building on top of it and save you money. That's all I'm. That's all I'm trying to do. Okay. Now, we got to raise our own money. We can't use your money. Well, in the past, you, there have been different ideas floated, but okay. Okay. So, so, I mean, so to clarify, we, we're talking about a, a, a city-financed parking structure right. that would be paid off using revenues from a private development. Oh, among it's thirty percent of it, forty percent of it, right? And we don't know that all these tax credits that you're referring to um, generally this evening disappear at the end of the year. We just know for certain that they're around till the end of the year, but they may be extended or we don't know. Right. But they cost us $400,000. And in this day and age, the $400,000 in equity is... Wait, what costs you $400,000? Yeah, yeah just, just to clarify, the, the Brownfield Michigan Business Tax Credit doesn't vaporize at the end of the year. There's a special provision at sunsets that allows a 20% credit in what's called an urban development area project which this would qualify for. The MEDC has already told us that. Um, instead, it would go down to a 15% credit. So that's the $400,000 Bob was talking so about. So 5% of this deal is $400,000? 5% of this deal is $400,000, right. It's and and that could be extended. Uh, who, who, th is that a legislature, uh, legislatively? That would be the legislature, yes. Our understanding, uh, our, our lobbyists tell us that it's not on the radar screen for reauthorization before the end of the year. Before the end of the year, but it could be the next session. Oh, it's, yeah, it certainly could be. Lots of things. I mean, any existing legislation expires after after late doc, so yeah, your guess is as good as mine, yeah. literally. I have one other. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, thanks. Um, a few points for for conversation, but my only other question um, tonight um, for Bob is that what we would be. Um, authorizing the, the city manager and the city attorney to uh, negotiate would essentially give you um, an, uh, sort of an exclusive option to develop that site so that you know that the money that you spend doing right. uh, all of this research and, you know, filing right. all of this paperwork with the state won't then, right. we, we won't then give the project to another exactly. okay. uh, Councilwoman Piano, why don't you go next and then all right, thanks. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, thank you. Um, really enjoy your building on, on Nine Mile, the law of nine, and you have proven that um, you're committed to Ferndale and you do um, good buildings. Um, I also think that the public private shop partnership is the direction for redevelopment in cities. Um, it's uh, cities uh, really are having trouble um, generating their own revenue to help offset the costs of any of these types of projects, and it definitely the banks aren't lending, so you have to do a potpourri of financial incentives in order to make these um, uh, projects work. And we're trying to solve two problems here. Uh, one is the financing and one is solving some parking challenges by increasing the parking amount. Um, and I also think long term this mixed use project um, helps us increase the number of residents downtown which has been a goal in our master plan and long term vision um, for the future. So I think those are all great reasons for us to um, consider this um, project in terms of determining whether it's feasible. Where I have problems um, is that, one, I think this whole presentation did you a disservice tonight. I think it was poorly presented um, and very difficult to ascertain um, some of these early complex questions that we've had. And um, so I think that's been... Um, something that I have um, felt uh, very disappointed in, in that um, there is a time crunch. I understand the incentives. I work with MEDC in my day job. Right. I understand that impact. Um, so that's where I'm having some problems. I feel like council was here as an afterthought. 
and we got this on Thursday, and we've had four days to assess this information, and yet we're asking to make a very um, dedicated and complex decision on an $8 million project. And so that's where I am frustrated. But at the end of the day, um, what I'm trying to make sure is I know what the facts are and what the unknown facts are. And this is an 80 apartment unit on top of the structure. It's going to need financing. The revenue is going to be approximately uh, tax revenue, $173,000 over a uh, period of time. But there's so many unknowns, and I know it's not to site plan and you haven't come up with an architectural design <coughs> yet. Um, but it's about, are they market-driven apartments? Are they low-income apartments? Um, how many spots are going to be dedicated to an apartment? And I've estimated 110. So how does that do 110 with the amount of parking that we um, want to increase in the downtown? I, I can't tell from my packet. Those even small, short-term goals. So th those are my concerns. Um, but overall, I think the end of the day, I need to know, is this going to be a fair and equitable deal for Ferndale? You know, is this going to be a giveaway? Who's going to get the revenue? I mean, these are all these things that I know that I have questions and I want to dive into now, which is supposed to be the development agreement. Um, so I think what I need to do is feel better about this. I, mean, I, I think I need a little bit more explanation about what it does it mean to dive into this development agreement. At the end, what is council going to get? What are we going to approve? What are we signing off on? What are we committing to? Um, you know, and then I and then I have issues with the the, the whole process of this. Um, has the planning director been involved? How much time has the city manager spent on this? The DDA has been working, I know, with Bob for quite a long time right. um, in terms of figuring out can this project be feasible. And now it's at our doorstep, and I feel immense pressure. Um, in order to do something where I feel really uncomfortable. Um, but yet I support redevelopment and where we're trying to go and that this opportunity is what other cities are starving for. Can I, uh, can I address that a little bit? One, obviously, I could come in here and spend $100,000 and give you boards and site plans and elevations and uh, numbers from consultants and do everything. Why would I spend any more money if unless I have some uh, ability to work with you guys to at least go through it. All the questions you're asking will be answered by giving me the time to sit down with the city manager and the city attorney and bring you guys into it at the same time. It, how do we get to there? The only way we can get there, we know the concept works. To give you the specifics on, you know, um, all the questions that you have, that's the reason why we're asking for this, mm -hmm. is we're not saying sign a development deal tomorrow right? or today. What we're asking for is to spend the time to help you, everybody understand why we believe that it works and how you can be protected and is it a fair deal and is it a not fair deal. And I mean, I guess you could say, well, you know, somebody else could go ahead and, and pay, pay more for those air rights. But it doesn't matter whether our apartment project is $60 million or $10 million. And it doesn't matter. You're going to either approve it of whether it's low income, middle income, whatever. It happens to be a project that is going to be very similar to what we did on Nine Mile Road that's affordable to most of the people that live in Ferndale. And it will be cooler and it will look great and it will be where People that make $30,000 a year or $40,000 a year will have a choice of where to live. And, but in order to do that, to show you, I mean, that's been my concept, is being able to get people in there that, that, can, that want to live in Ferndale but don't really have a choice of where they can live. Right. And this brings up the level of a lot of things. It makes, I think, the, the city look great better, the street looks better. It would be a really important part to it. But I can't. Put, I got, can't put the cart before the horse. I got to get to everybody to say, you know, here's what our plan is going to be, and here's why, and here's protection mm -hmm. for you guys as far as, you know, should somebody else come in from Chicago and talk about doing this after I get done doing it? After I figured out how to get $173,000 that nobody else really is paying attention to? I mean, I do live in the city. I work in the city. I enjoy being here, and I have 
been one of the few people that figured out how to get $10 million into a project in the city that didn't say they were going to do it and didn't do it. So, If I may, let me ask Mr. Bruner if he wants to share anything with regards to the questions that Councilwoman Piano brought up. Yeah, um, I've spent somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 16 hours on this project, uh, a couple hours meeting with Mr. Wolfson, uh, a couple hours talking to the city attorney about it, and somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 hours uh, preparing this memo. And basically what I'm asking for at this point is direction as to whether or not you want the rest of those questions answered. Um, if you're interested in hearing the answers to those questions, then what I would encourage the council to do is to direct me and the city attorney to pursue this further. But if this isn't something that the council is interested in pursuing now because the timeline is too short, the project is too complex, whatever the issue may be, then I don't want to spend a lot of my time and energy pushing a rock up the hill just to find out that it was the wrong rock or the wrong hill. So that's why I'm asking for direction at this point. Bob, am I right in understanding that you, you spent eight hours on this and an additional 16 hours on doing something else uh, relative to this project? No, all total somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 16 hours. Eight to 16 total. Between the time I've spent discussing it with Mr. Wolfson, I think we've met two or three times. One of those times with, with his attorney, I've discussed it with Christina. We met once last week to or once last week and once the week before to prepare this particular memo. As she indicated, she had generated a lot of information from the DDA about parking revenues and so forth. And so I was trying to distill that down into something that was relatively short and easy to understand. <clears throat> well, here's my thinking on it, and that is we, we like your, your building, Mr. Wilson. It's a nice way to energize the east side of uh, Nine Mile. Right. Uh, once the commercial area is fully occupied with the, you know, the hair salon with the uh, Italian bistro or cafe, whatever right. it is, and whatever else is going to go in there, and we've got people walking in and out the doors and cars driving in, it's going to be very, very exciting. Right. I, I think what troubles me about this proposal is, first of all, as I've said before, uh, giving us a two-week deadline to manage something like this. Um, I hear the city manager saying that he took anywhere from one-third to two-thirds of, uh, do I have that right, uh, 20 to 40 percent, I should say, of one week in order to put together a two-page proposal, uh, a memo that for me leaves a lot of things unanswered, um, which suggests to me that in order to negotiate, uh, prepare, and uh, present a development agreement, in two weeks from this evening would require all of the city manager's time uh, between now and then. Uh, we are in the midst of uh, a reorganization here in City Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the whole City Hall torn up, uh, as you can see. And uh, I'm very excited in talking to you about this and getting the details and figuring it out and, and working with you. <coughs> I might even be willing to give you an exclusive option for uh, or be willing to support an exclusive option, as you discuss for a short period of time, perhaps for some consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all things that I think are exciting and uh, great that we're in a position to discuss them. But to ask the city to drop everything that we're doing in order to negotiate a development agreement with you on what seems to me to be, um, at least at this period, and I hope it's not you know, this way in the future, but fairly speculative um, development uh, or, or project here uh, when we're in the midst of labor negotiations and reorganizing City Hall and uh, a number of other things just to me seems like a pretty big ask and uh, without a clear roadmap as to where we get how we get to where we need to be on October 25th to allow you to go to the state seems to me that we're really rushing things unnecessarily I hear the 5% argument, and right. I understand and get it that that's not insignificant. That's real money uh, on a project of this scale. But um, I, I think to direct our city uh, staff to negotiate a development agreement in uh, 13 days, uh, nine days, I guess, really, mm -hmm. if you take out the weekends, uh, is just an unrealistic timeline. And I wish you'd come to us with this in June uh, or uh, sooner. But but you didn't, and that's fine. Um, I really want to talk to you about this, but I want to talk 
on a, a little bit extended timeline. Council, let me jump in, if I may, because we've gone certainly now beyond requesting information, and now we're we're sharing opinions, mm -hmm. which we should only do if there's a motion on the table. So, can I make one more comment? Sure, go ahead. I think that the timelines that are discussed. I don't think this project, as far as I'm concerned, what I'm more interested in is moving forward. Not necessarily did we get that at the last date, I need a signature tomorrow morning or anything else. But I'd like to get the ball rolling. And maybe, maybe there won't be a reduction of that 5%. And maybe there will be a reduction of that. But in order for me to move this, if it's something that people are interested in, then I'm very interested. I don't know if it would be any different as an example if I just picked a piece of property down the street and said, I'd like to build a $10 million project. And I'd like a, a what do you call it, a tax, um, what do they call it, uh, abatement. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I do it, please? And I'm not even asking for the tax abatement. I'm asking to give you the taxes. So I see it as a way to... to get things mo moving. If the time deadlines are hard, at least let me get the ball rolling to get it started All right, appreciate to learn it. something. Thank you. We're starting to repeat. Um, I do have any last question. questions or requests for information? Yeah. Yes. Please. Um, would the DDA be part of helping pull together this development agreement? Because I would see, I would suggest, um, I'll hold off on my opinion, but will the DDA be part of helping craft this development agreement? If the city so chooses. I think that we can add valuable content to it. Obviously, we've been working for, for months on this, and I think that we also have a, a fairly good understanding of what we would like to see in our downtown area. We have a downtown development plan that was adopted through the master plan process that identifies the site as a potential mixed-use development. So I, I think that we can definitely add that, um, that input as well as the input that we're also getting from MEDC um, in terms of, and also kind of local legislation that we might have to take into consideration. Thank you. The answer from her viewpoint was yes. Mr. Bruner, any reason that the DDA can't be involved in the negotiation? No, I, I mean, it is an A to B transaction, but at some point the DDA does have to designate its TIF revenue back to the parking structure uh, in order to, to make this work. So at a minimum, the DDA would have to be involved in that aspect of the project. So the answer is yes. Yes. Councilwoman Baker? I have one more question um, based on uh, Bob Wolfson's last um, comment. Are you saying, Bob, that if if I made a motion tonight um, to instruct our, our city staff and our DDA staff to begin negotiations on a development agreement with you and, you know, either because they have a lot of things on their plate or perhaps it's not designated a brownfield or any number of things, some of these deadlines are missed, um, you would still you know, be interested in, in at least continuing to see the, yes. whether or not it's feasible. Yes, I just would like to know whether to forget it or move you know, forward. Or start move forward and get you answers. So I, ideally we'd be able to hit all of the targets to make that December 1st tar timeline. But if we didn't hit all of if those targets, didn't. it doesn't mean... Right, and if it requires too much time from the city manager to get something done, or anybody to get it done, then we'll have to deal with that. But at least it makes things get rolling. I feel better about that. Okay. About that comment, um, that there there is an, an understanding on the part of the developer that um, I mean, I've, Bob's been looking for two years to do his next thing in Ferndale. So That's right. okay, again, I, I want to try to not sure. You're right. You're right. I can make a motion if you'd like. It's to really know. tough. I well, yeah, I'm not even going to ask a question. Your answer to your question was yes. And let's get a motion on the table. Then we can share opinions without worrying. I would move to direct the city attorney, city manager, and DDA director to negotiate a development agreement with Robert Wolfson. Support. And its motion is made and seconded. And that, that obviously comes back to us. It's so they're negotiating a, a possible agreement that would come back to council. So I just want to make okay. that really clear. Yep. So, and so now there is a motion made. Now, Councilman, go ahead. Sure. So, if our concern, you know, if others up here share my concern that um, two weeks is a unrealistic time frame in every imaginable way uh, to get this done, 
how does that motion uh, basically direct the city manager not to spend too much time on it? What sort of timeline are we looking for? Personally, I think um, something before, uh, I don't know, middle of December, middle of November is a, a realistic time frame to get this done and not make it a, you know, top, you know, the absolute top of his to-do list. Where's, where did the two weeks, where's the two-week deadline? That was while you were out. Uh, that's a d d deadline it, that the uh, DDA director told this us. This is based on your current council meeting. Of course, you could have a special could meeting. Have special council meeting. Um, but in order for them to begin um, developing plans, getting their BRA together, um, they need to know whether or not they should be doing that. So, so if we granted a, a two-week exclusive option to develop this deal, that's sufficient for you? I suspect that's not, right? Oh. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I mean, what's uh, a real, I mean, that's silly, right? So, uh, I mean, we, get, we need to give the city administration some guidance from up here as to when we're going to expect a deal to be cut. Um, and I, don't, I, I think by remaining silent on it, what we're saying is two weeks. And so I would not be supportive of that. Well, do motion. we, though? I mean, let's ask the city manager, since he's sitting there. Um, Who's, uh, who's a paid professional who, who we hire to be our manager. I, I think the first step that I would take if this motion uh, were passed as presented, the first step that I would take would be to meet with Mr. Wolfson, uh, his attorney and the city attorney, and, and sketch out what we think is a feasible time frame, given what I know about the council meetings, its deadlines, the types of information that you're going to want to see, as well as all the other things that are going on in, in the city. So that would likely be my first step to begin working with Mr. Wilson on what is a reasonable uh, timeline, bring that back to council for, for feedback again, and then uh, if approved, try to implement it. And how, how do we, I mean, is there some danger of us losing something? That's what I'm missing. And maybe, Councilman, you could Sure, because I, I hear you. I'm not but sure what we have to lose. Well, if we miss a deadline yeah. or well, the thing doesn't happen, yeah. what do we lose? Well, here, here's my impression of what we lose, and, and that is two weeks of staff and attorney time, um, working on something that is very poorly fleshed out, uh, not at all explained, uh, that there's been with information either – I mean, there's information out there. The DDA felt comfortable making a recommendation on it. This is one of the most poorly sourced agenda items I've seen in nine years up here. Um, there just is no information in it. Um, and so I don't know how we give direction on or make an informed decision as to a development uh, agreement that is going to be, uh, as requested by Mr. Wilson, a, a giveaway uh, of the parking lot and perhaps the city bonding out, you know, close to $8 million um, when I don't understand, you know, how the numbers work or really what we're trying to achieve. I understand pre-building parking thing. I, I get that. I want it the same as anybody else. Um, but you know, I don't know how to – if well, you came back with a development agreement in two weeks, I would have no basis for evaluating it, and I couldn't make a decision. So, so I don't think I, I don't think any sort of time frame before we're fully educated on what the development project is, what this public-private partnership is. Wonderful words, everyone that loves them. Doesn't say that though in that agreement. That doesn't say that there's any deadlines in there at all, does it? That no, that's what um, was ex that was what was explained to me again. That it has it, to it, have certain dates. If no. the agenda item was that was, was properly up worked up, we wouldn't have had any confusion. That has that that letter that Bob has just says that we're going to work together. I don't even have that but in in our council well, packet. If you don't mind, it says certain federal and state subsidies that may be used to finance the project are scheduled to expire December thirty first, which right. is what you had talked about. So that's the deadline we feel. If we don't get the agreement by then, you won't get your financing, and this project will fall through. No, I, well, and I'm clarifying that right now. If you want to make this. 30 days, 60 days, whatever you want that, that makes them them comfortable. I want to. I can't get any of these answers or do any of the work without letting you guys help me get information for you. And and so, as far as I'm concerned, if the deadline is what is going to change this deal, because no one's going to get it done in two weeks, and you're not going to have time to review it 
at it immediately, then I'm going to back off on that and say, we'll figure it out. And, you know, we'll work to, to mm -hmm. make it work between the city attorney and the city manager. Yeah. Even though I express concerns, I do support having this project be explored. I think that is worth the time and effort um, for our city to do. Granted, we have some serious staff um, resource problems um, in order to get this done. Um, and I would also suggest that this not be done in a vacuum. You know, some cities create joint development agreement um, committees that the city manager, right. the DDA, the planning commission representative, right. and a council member is on here. And I would suggest that that would be pulled together to help us be part of deciding how this complex project is going to be pulled together. And like I said, I don't want to be surprised up here right. with a bunch of information that I haven't been walked through. And I say that is, is because tonight council got emailed the DDA board packet, and in it is a very good explanation of what this project is. But it, it makes sense. It just sort of came it, so it, sort of typical it, last minute type stuff. It's just so clear. Well, we, all right, we do hear you, and I appreciate those comments, it's Council. It's clearer than right. mud. Well, the other stuff. I agree with the partnership and, and maybe a council member can be. Um, I know I personally, I have met with Mr. Wolfson. I kind of assumed that some of you had also met with him at time from time to time. Is that incorrect? I've I met was with on this project, on the Willington project? In general, yeah, in general. In general? Uh, in general, yeah. Well, it comes down to the meat and potatoes specifics and numbers no, and, yeah, no and how it's going to impact the neighborhood. I'd also recommend that I haven't heard in the development agreement and um, Quite a few of you already know I support public engagement and I want to make sure that our residents aren't surprised on this and if right. the city relies on public hearings alone to communicate this project uh, I'm going to be upset um, so we That's need to think out of the box right. on how to engage our residents around the site and I would I hope um, that the city planning department and the DDA is helpful in leading those efforts to make sure that people are um, not surprised that they are part of and an effective engagement process to inform them about this project. Which begins tonight because yes. they're watching on the show and it's uh, how many stories possible? Six. Six stories. The uh, western half of the Whittington parking lot. The eastern. Eastern. Thank you. Any thoughts to move forward, Councilwoman? I, I don't. I don't necessarily feel the need to put a specific timeline into my motion. I'm I don't, ready to take a vote. I don't see a need for a timeline either. Yeah. All right. Uh, then. Well, you know, I, I would like to offer an amendment to the uh, motion, and that is that City Council uh, be provided with everything that has been presented to the city or to the DDA in regards to this uh, apparently ongoing discussions regarding. Uh, the Withington parking lot. So every pro forma, every document that was provided by uh, Bob Wilson or any of the entities associated with him to the city or shared by the city with Bob Wilson should be made available to the um, you know legislative body of, of the city of Ferndale. Support. Did you say second? Yes, sir. Amendment made and seconded. Discussion. I agree. Let's vote on the amendment, Madam Clerk. Did you catch that? Yes. Thank Council you. members Lennon? Yes. Fiona? Yes. Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes, as well. With no objection, Madam Clerk, a vote on the uh, motion in general with the amended. Are you ready to vote? Yes, ma'am. Council members Piana? Yes. Baker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good luck. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk, what's next on the agenda? We have regular agenda item C, consideration of naming the soccer field at Martin Road Park, the Nelson House Kids Dream Field. Sorry about that. That's okay. Who will introduce this item, Mr. Bruner? You or Mr. Fotides? He, oh, stepped, out of the office. he stepped out of the office, out of the room. Byron Fotides, would you come up and talk to us about the Dream Field Name, dedication for Mr. Nelson House, the late Mr. Nelson House. Well, we thought it would be apropos for um, the city to recognize Nelson for all the philanthropic and civic-minded um, endeavors 
that uh, he worked entirely say for, and one of which was the um, Dreamfield. Um, I've been with the city almost 38 years, and most of those years were as the Parks and Recreation Director. Um, and this Nelson uh, was very instrumental in raising over $40,000, which is probably the most we ever received from a, uh, a private um, endeavor, endeavor to, for recreational facilities in the city. And um, having, um, it took about three years, and of course we all know that that was the impetus for the idea of the Dream Cruise, uh, which um, um, helped fund the, uh, the field because it was basically through the sale of um, uh, Dream Cruise merchandise where they were able to raise this money, and Nelson was very instrumental in that. Uh, having coached uh, a soccer team in the city um, for eight years, we used that field when it was first uh, constructed. And um, I just think uh, Nelson should uh, receive his due, or Mr. House should receive his due. Uh, um, I don't think he would have sought it out, but I think um, it's important for the city to recognize it. Thank you. Um, certainly, I think you you got the nail right in the head. We we actually talked up here when, when he passed, and we did the resolution that we would like to consider naming the soccer field. Um, and, Your Honor, I... Like I, I very much agree with the comments that were made. I think um, the Nelson House Kids Dream Field is a very appropriate honor uh, for Nelson and all he contributed for the city. Uh, when we passed the resolution, however, his son was very adamant that no city funds be expended in any way on the project. So I would move that we approve naming the soccer field at Martin Road Park the Nelson House Kids Dream Field and that no city funds be expended uh, on any sort of uh, signage or, or recognition. However, if and when private uh, monies are uh, become available for that project, that uh, signage be, uh, that consideration of that signage be um, come back before city council. Support, I had exactly the same uh, request for information and I wondered um, if there's a plan, I mean, is this something that perhaps Maybe his family could start, you know. Or the Community Foundation could help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, again, we'd, we really didn't get to do the request for, for information, but I was uh, uh, going to ask if the Ferndale Community Foundation could be a recipient for the funds. I think we talked about that possibility. Um, I also would like to ask if, if the signage could match uh, all of the signage that we're redoing with the DDA, all of the, uh, what do you call it? Um, wayfinding? The wayfinding stuff. So these are questions that should be asked, but, uh, and Councilman, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, Sean House specifically wanted this done with private funds, so um, I think the motion, you know, could have said that we'll use private funds for this, but in any case, uh, did that get seconded? I seconded it. All right. And did you have a question then? My question, um, I guess, was who now um, bears the responsibility of raising the money for it? Is this something that we should talk with our um, events manager, Michael Larry, about, about how Dream Cruise revenues are, are allocated when merchandise is sold, since that is sort of the original way that monies were raised? Um, who should be applying to the Community Foundation? Do we leave that? To well, his family or the DPW? A couple of us are on the community foundation. I can get in contact with the family. Okay. With Sean, I should say. I just wanted to make sure we had a, some think, sort of a I bit think of a the plan. motion, though, is that the council agrees that we can name the Absolutely. soccer field mm -hmm. after Nelson yes. House. The private funds will be used to construct any uh, future sign that we put together. And I'm just verbally <laughs> requesting that it match in color or style some of the signage that we're getting put in with the uh, wayfinding program. Discussion. Oh. Mm -hmm. or, or match, you know, match something, as opposed to just a big, a big sign. White mm -hmm. sign, like the baseball diamond one. Yeah. Any discussion, Madam Clerk? Council Member Spaker? Yes. Galloway? Yes. Lennon? Yes. Piano? Yes. Mayor Covey? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, what's next? Council liaison reports, if any. I have none tonight. Nothing from nothing, Mr. Bruner. Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Thank you. Anyone else? Liaison reports? Um, yes. 
I would like to follow up on the presentation of the Michigan Suburbs Alliance via the Regional Energy Office tonight um, um, and just talk about um, how great this program is. I think coming to Michigan, this was some um, President Obama's um, energy efficiency money in the state of Michigan went on a collaborative grant um, with the state of Michigan, the Suburbs Alliance, the city of Detroit, the city of Grand Rapids to do these energy efficiency sweeps. And we're really looking at 400 homes in Ferndale to do these sweeps, and it's, um, I think, a, quite an honor to be selected. I didn't personally select us. Um, however, there were some key indicators that made us a good city. Um, one is that um, there was a, a champion in the city, and I uh, um, support that um, through the Suburbs Alliance. Um, the program will result in approximately $420,000 in direct investment in Ferndale residences and um, save these homeowners a ton of money on energy costs. Um, another reason Ferndale was selected or this particular neighborhood was um, the rate of home ownership. Um, those were some criteria put forth by the state. Um, but Ferndale, I think, in my opinion, was selected um, overall as the first community to be the pilot um, was our strong leadership on being a green community and the choices and policies that the council has put together in the last 10 years. Um, the majority of here has been on it. And so um, I, th I thank you and this program um, fits so well here. There's going to be a ton of more information coming down from the regional energy office um, to council, to um, city staff and to the residents. And so um, we're at the bid you know, um, this program is at the beginning stages, and so I'm really excited, and I um, really hope um, the homeowners will will be um, will participate. Super. All right, Madam Clerk, are we at call to council? We are, Your Honor. I'm going to start with Julie Hall, Recreation Director. Anything else to share? A uh, Police Chief Tim Collins. Thank you, sir. Fire Chief Kevin Sullivan. What's up tonight? Thank you kindly. Byron Fotides, anything else from DPW? No, no. All right, leaves are being raked. So they're going to start getting collected soon. Yes. Very good. All right, don't park over the leaves, however, right, Chief Sullivan? Right. You'll set your car on fire, which you don't want to do. All right, Madam Clerk, what do you have to talk about? Don't forget to vote November 2nd. If you need an absentee voter ballot, please call the clerk's office. And are there voter guides around? There are many, many voter guides from the League of Women Voters available at City Hall and at the Public Library. Well, certainly. All the information, bipartisan, Supreme Court, all sorts of issues. If you don't vote, you don't count. Madam Clerk, when is the deadline for absentee? The Monday at 4 o'clock before Election Day, the day before the Election Day. So you've got plenty of time to get an absentee ballot. November 2nd is the election. Mr. Bruner, what do you have to talk about? Uh, nothing further tonight, Your Honor. Really? Okay, very good. Uh, City Attorney, sir. I have nothing, Your Honor. All right, and you did share a little bit about the county prosecutor. I, I did. It was an informative meeting. Uh, as I indicated earlier, there was not a consensus uh, with respect to the appropriate approach. Uh, there, I did share what the City of Ferndale had done thus far and, and uh, there was certainly interest both from the prosecutor as well as from other municipal attorneys uh, in the county. Uh, but there is a broad range of, uh, of uh, action, and a number of communities are, are simply extending the moratorium right. to allow this to play out further. All right. Well, if I may, just since it's on the subject again of medical marijuana, I want to share what, I, what I'm intending to do and work on. I have a, a lunch meeting set up with State Senator Gillard Jacobs, our state senator. I also have... Uh, phone call in to State Representative Ellen Kogan Lipton, who's our state representative. There is a model that is working very well in this country, and it's, it's uh, the model that Oakland, California adopted. And in that city, uh, medical marijuana facilities seem to be working very, very well. There is no increase in crime around the facilities. There doesn't seem to be any abuse at the facilities. And, and they're all, in, in that city anyway, they are required to be nonprofit organizations. That might be the route that we could explore the state of Michigan going. Um, you know, I'm not overly optimistic, but it, at least uh, we will present this information to our senator and our state representative, and maybe we can get some sort of bipartisan support in Lansing, so that we can move, you know, move beyond this uh, state of of uh, uh, 
not progress, a state of uh, inertia that we're in right now. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, or Councilman Lennon, what do you want to talk about? I have nothing tonight, Your Honor. Councilman Galloway, what do you got? Uh, November 2nd, of course, is the election. Uh, people are asked for a charter amendment in the city of Ferndale uh, to give their consideration to. And I believe the Oakland Press is uh, doing a story on this. TheOaklandPress.com uh, might have some video or text on it up at this point. Uh, but it's an opportunity for folks to uh, further have some say in how their government is structured here in Ferndale. Very good. And Wednesday morning, uh, the seniors over at the Kulik Center, and anyone's welcome, can, can come, and, and I'll be there addressing the issues and talking about the Charter Amendment. So if you're interested in learning more about the Ferndale Charter Amendment, which is on the ballot, that is this Wednesday, the 13th, yes. whatever Wednesday is, 11 a.m. Kulik Center. Councilwoman Piana. Yes, I have a few things. Go ahead. Um, since I missed the last meeting um, due to illness, um, I was at the Michigan Municipal League conference representing um, the city along with city manager Bob Bruner. And um, the sessions that I attended was social media, not only for individually for elected officials about how do we communicate better with our residents and businesses, um, but also how do cities communicate um, better with their residents in terms of um, um, emergency management, just relative, you know, issues going on with the city and getting feedback um, on from public input. Um, and I think it's very relevant to um, Council's 2010's goals of the external communications plan and how the city will be, um, what its policies are and formalizing more, formalizing its communications <laughs> policies. And I think um, I will encourage city staff um, to think about how we can use social media um, to, to share what's going on inside City Hall um, collectively as a team, um, Team Ferndale, City Hall Ferndale, so, um, as well as the police departments, fire departments, and parks and rec. Um, complete streets, um, I was asked about where is the complete streets ordinance with Ferndale. Um, due to my illness last week, week um, I was unable to make some of the amendments um, that need to happen in the ordinance and works through some of um, administrative items with the city manager. I will make sure that I have everything on the council agenda um, for the October 25th meeting as well as uh, my presentation. I also wanted to give out um, kudos to the city of Berkeley, um, Councilman Steve Baker, who I work closely with on Complete Streets. Um, the city of Berkeley passed the Complete Streets resolution and um, the Michigan transportation budget that was recently passed um, gives preference to cities um, in terms of grant um, awards uh, that for cities that have passed complete streets policies. So um, there's still only 10, 11, or less than 15 cities in Michigan that have passed this. So um, I look forward to bringing that forward. And then I also wanted to say that we do have um, a ballot initiative on November 2nd, following up with um, what Mr. Galloway has said. And I wanted to let people know that there is a source of information that you can go to in order to learn about um, the ballot initiative. And you can go to FerndaleChange.com. If you can catch that bell there, FerndaleChange.com. So um, please go um, learn um, about what this means um, to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for speaking right into the microphone, too. You <laughs> certainly um, yeah. you woke me up. Yeah. No, yeah. nice job. I usually sit back and people say that I am too quiet. So I'm taking their advice. I've never said you're too quiet. <laughs> um, did, did Mayor Pro Tem go? Not yet. Uh, sorry, you're next. Sorry, I'm, I'm reading the voter guide over uh, Councilman Lennon's shoulder and, and actually noticing how many um, particularly incumbents in safe districts didn't bother to respond to the League of Women Voters. Uh, it was, yeah, fairly shocking, but that... I did. I think I'm in there. Oh, I wasn't talking about you. We haven't gotten to you, got, we we got right you yet. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're at the end. Um, uh, I am, um, I, just, I, I said it on my, on my Facebook page, but I want to say it here, too. I'm, I'm, I'm proud that um, the City Council has been as uh, transparent as possible, um, understanding that we can't um, talk specifically about um, a lot of the things that we're negotiating with our unions, but I'm, I'm, I'm proud that 
Um, we've been as, as transparent as we can. We've tried to keep the citizens informed about what's going on um, when it comes to conversations with our unions. Um, there are, you know, we're in a very contentious situation. And I think that everyone knows that um, and, and understands that the city's in a tough position, just like cities all over southeastern Michigan and all over the state right now. Um, so we will just continue to do our best um, to find a resolution that, um, you know, works for the residents um, and works for our employees and is as fair as possible. Um, and we'll just keep telling you about it as there are developments. Um, as far as I know, there haven't been any new developments recently um, that we can talk about, but hopefully soon. Very good. Well, then, I think I'm up. Um, Mr. Bruner, I was going to ask you if you could share just a, a moment on whether there's any progress in terms of negotiations with our public safety union. As it stands now, we have arbitration hearings scheduled with um, the fire union in January and the police union in December. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have indicated to both unions that we're uh, willing to meet on or off the record about those negotiations. Um, at this point, there are not any additional uh, meetings scheduled at this time. So if the arbitration process goes forward as planned, uh, we would expect to receive an arbitrator's award uh, in June or July um, for those two processes, which are on very similar parallel tracks. However, there's nothing that would um, prevent the city and the unions from reaching an agreement earlier if we are actually able to reach an agreement outside of arbitration. Okay, thank you. Well, real quick, um, I hope to have a neat, pretty cool announcement in two weeks about a possible new company that is thinking of moving to Ferndale, working with a real estate uh, uh, agent person. Um, so I can't share that yet, but I think it it's, looks pretty good, and it'll be pretty exciting if I can share that in a, in a week or two. Um, second of all, I do want to address just briefly, there's been a lot of news lately about bullying, and we've seen a lot of news um, and online about uh, suicides in young people, teenagers particularly. I just want to share that um, this, is, this is such a tragedy, and while bullying has been around forever, and all, most of us probably went through some form of it as kids, it seems to be a lot more intense. It seems to be um, very obtrusive, and it seems to be uh, constant in the sense that in the old days you could go home from school and at least get some peace, whereas now with online and um, some of the Internet stuff, some of these folks that are being bullied are, are bullied 24 hours a day. And, and the saddest part is that some of these kids are ended up taking their own lives. I just want to share that it's really uh, parents' responsibilities, uh, or it's parents' responsibility, and, and we as adults, to, to try to demonstrate and to teach our young people tolerance and empathy. There seems to be a huge lack of empathy these days, and I, I can't explain why. Um, but. You know, we in Ferndale have prided ourselves on being a very inclusive and open city uh, where everyone is welcome. We like to think of ourselves as a town that is welcoming, and we have a, a substantial gay community, but also other minorities. We have seniors, we have youth, we have different nationalities. Um, but that doesn't mean we can become complacent. Um, bullying occurs everywhere. It occurs in every school. And, and kids are targeted just for being different. Um, while the gay-lesbian issue seems to be prevalent, um, kids can be harassed and bullied because they look different, because they're skinny, because they're not skinny or they're fat. Um, in one case, uh, an 11-year-old boy um, was bullied so much because he liked to wear pink shirts, and he ended up killing himself. And there's just no reason for that kind of, of uh, awful behavior to have to go on. So. <clears throat> Again, I only share this because it's been all over the news, but, um, you know, it's not just teachers, it's not just the police department, it's not just the city council members, but it's every parent and every uncle and every grandparent that has to take their kid aside and talk to them about empathy and, uh, and also not being afraid to report bullying. And also for those who do get bullied or those who feel like there's no solution and that the only uh, option they have is to take their own lives. I just want to tell them that um, that it gets better, and if you can if you can survive and if you can talk to an adult or talk to a parent or talk to an uncle um, and get some support, 
um, that it does get better. Um, no other business tonight. Uh, thanks for watching this program, and have a good fall. Good fall. You're not coming back. We, we, we'll be back before <laughs> fall expires. Well, we? I think have a.